There we go. Ah, yes, they've accepted that you're recording. Great. There it goes. Okay, so it's it's recording somewhere. Okay. It's recording. At least that's what the disembodied voice just told me. Um, <laughs> so, so that's great. Um, and yeah, super. So it's quiz time. It's quiz time, and Sally's the host. So Sally, Sally can launch it. All right. So I will be launching the poll shortly. However, before we begin, <laughs> I would like to say <clears throat> this important message from your quiz master, Jack. Please note, odd numbered questions are, quote, easy peasy. <laughs> so everyone should hopefully get at least five right. If you don't, I won't tell. Even numbered questions are more difficult, but don't worry. If you don't get the correct answer, you will learn something new and interesting about old time radio. Are we prepared for the quiz? I'll take that overwhelming silence as yes! <laughs> I'm going to launch the poll and remember, you may select your answer in the poll. You may move faster than I will read. I will be reading the question and answers two times. So I will be moving much slower. We will go over the answers at the end. I will show the results on the poll at the end. It will not show who chose what, so don't worry if you get it wrong. <laughs> and on the telephone, you use paper and pencil. Grab your paper and pencil now. I'll give you like 20 seconds because I need to grab water. <laughs> Questions. No cheating. <laughs> I am prepared. All right. Poll is launching. <laughs> can I get a thumbs up that you can see the poll? You Thank you. Fascinating. Number one. A popular old time radio quiz show had three regular panelists, John Kieran, Franklin P. Adams, and Oscar Levant, plus a guest. What was this radio program called? <coughs> a, information please. B, information thanks. C, information you're welcome. D, too much information. <laughs> A popular old-time radio quiz show had three regular panelists, John Kieran, Franklin P. Adams, and Oscar Levant, plus a guest. What was this radio program called? A. Information, please. B. Information, thanks. C. Information, you're welcome. D. Too much information. Sally, you might want to mute the rest of us to prevent I just the, uh, realized that. Yes, I'm going to do that right now. So you can still hear me, though, correct? I hope. OK, I'm seeing lots of nods. I love the power. Number two. Out on the plains with the Lone Ranger, Tonto would be riding A. Unnamed mule. B. Scout. C. Whitefeller. D. Any of the above. Out on the plains with the Lone Ranger, Tonto would be riding A. Unnamed mule. B. Scout. C. Whitefeller. D. Any of the above.
Number three. Virginia Payne had the leading role on a soap opera on both NBC and CBS for 27 years, and she was the highest paid soap opera actor. What was the name of her long running program? A. Crazy Old Lady. B. Mary Backstage Noble Wife. C. Ma Perkins. D. The Life and Loves of Maudie Frickert. Virginia Payne had the leading role on a soap opera on both NBC and CBS for 27 years, and she was the highest paid soap opera actor. What was the name of her long running program? A. Crazy Old Lady. B. Mary Backstage Noble Wife. C. Ma Perkins. D. The Life and Loves of Maudie Frickert. Number four. Frederick Ziv's company produced many successful syndicated radio series. Which is the only one of the below that was not his? A. Boston Blackie. B. Fox 13. C. The Cisco Kid. D. Bold Venture. Frederick Ziv's company produced many successful syndicated radio series. Which is the only one of the below that was not his? A. Boston Blackie. B. Fox 13. C. The Cisco Kid. D. Bold Venture. So I can't see the answers anyway. Number five. Gene Autry's horse was famous in his movies, but not so much on his radio show, Melody Ranch. However, this horse eventually got his own radio show. What was that horse's name? A. Champion. B. Runner Up. C. Bronze Medalist. D. Sore Loser. Gene Autry's horse was famous in his movies, but not so much on his radio show, Melody Ranch. However, this horse eventually got his own radio show. What was that horse's name? A. Champion. B. Runner Up. C. Bronze Medalist. D. Sore Loser. Number six. Quiz programs, either humorous or serious, became very popular on network radio prior to World War II. But which one of these Q and A shows was the first to air nationally? A. Dr. IQ. B. Pot of Gold. C. Vox Pop. D. Double or Nothing. Quiz programs, either humorous or serious, became very popular on network radio prior to World War II. But which one of these Q&A shows was the first to air nationally? A. Dr. IQ. B. Pot of Gold. C. Vox Pop. D. Double or Nothing. Question seven. What do all these towns have in common? Pine Ridge, Arkansas, Gene Autry, Oklahoma, and Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. A. Each one is adjacent to a large and famous waterfall. B. All of them permit only left-handed people 
on their city council. C. Every one of them was originally their state capital. D. They all acquired their current name in connection with a radio show. What do all these towns have in common? Pine Ridge, Arkansas, Gene Autry, Oklahoma, and Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. A. Each one is adjacent to a large and famous waterfall. B. All of them permit only left-handed people on their city council. C. Every one of them was originally their state capital. D. They all acquired their current name in connection with the radio show. <clears throat> Number eight. What was Candy Matson's apartment telephone number? A. Yukon 2 2809. B. Yukon 2 8209. C. Yukon 2 8902. D. Yukon 2 9802. I wish I had pre read that question. Number 8. What was Candy Madsen's apartment telephone number? A. Yukon 2 2809. B. Yukon 2 8209. C. Yukon 2 8902. D. Yukon 2 9802. That was hard to do without thinking. I had to really think that one through. Whew. That was a quiz for me. Number nine. Ovaltine sponsored a kids flying adventure show called A. Sky Queen. B. Colonel Mustard. C. Dudley Do Right. D. Captain Midnight. Ovaltine sponsored a kids flying adventure show called A. Sky Queen. B. Colonel Mustard. C. Dudley Do Right. D. Captain Midnight. Final question. Number 10. The brilliant pianist and classical composer George Gershwin got his own radio show music by Gershwin in 1934, first on NBC Blue and later on CBS. Name his announcer and sponsor. A. Milton Cross and Brunswick Records. B. Ken Carpenter and Bell Telephone. C. Don Wilson and Phenomint Laxative Chewing Gum. D. Hugh James and Metropolitan Life Insurance. The brilliant pianist and classical composer George Gershwin got his own radio show, Music by Gershwin, in 1934, first on NBC Blue and later on CBS. Name his announcer and sponsor. A. Milton Cross and Brunswick Records. B. Ken Carpenter and Bell Telephone. C. Don Wilson and Phenomint Laxative Chewing Gum. D. Hugh James and Metropolitan Life Insurance. You have 20 seconds to complete answers in the poll. Ten seconds.
Please complete your polling answers now. I'm going to end the poll. And go over the answers. Right, we are going over the answers now. Before we had broken it up. I'm doing it now. I have power. I have power. Okay, you can unmute yourself if you have, you know, you can laugh so that it's not yeah. like me talking to the void. It is a little creepy. Thanks, Alan. And you, Paul. We've been doing them after the after the presentation. So would you like well, me to hold it? I'm sorry. Right, I thought that 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 we did the answers after after the presentation. Okay, well I ended the poll. You can't do Ooh. But so you don't have to post the poll results. Suspense. <laughs> Great. So then it's Frank's I'll show the turn. results afterwards. Yep. And Frank, Let's your co-host, right? No. Not anymore. Oh, I, I'll, I will make oh. Can you make him a host yep. so he can uh, launch his? There you go. All righty then. That Frank. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody, I guess. Good call. Okay. Now, let me. First off, can everybody hear me? Shake your heads. Can't hear me? Oh, okay. I want to thank Wendy for spending time with me so that when, <clears throat> when I launch this, you'll be able to see it and hear it. And I want to thank my friend, Chris, who I work with, who came out here Monday and set me up with a microphone so that I wouldn't sound like I did last month and, uh, you know, got me going again tonight. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Wendy. All right. You know, last month you listened to my voice during the first 15. And tonight you're going to hear the voices primarily of the great actors who portrayed the wonderful characters who lived in the town of Wistful Vista and often passed through the neighborhood and home of Fibber McGee and Molly. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax Products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly with Bill Thompson, Gail Gordon, Arthur Q. Bryan, and me, Marla Wilcox. From the late 1930s until the mid-1950s, Jim and Marion Jordan brought their brand of humor to millions of radio listeners. The Jordans were so identified by the characters that they played that when they did the uh, suspense episode, Backseat Driver, they were only identified as Fibber McGee and Molly and not by their, by their names. As synonymous as their names became uh, Fibber McGee and Molly, the Jordans, they also added a new term to the vernacular of America, and it's in the, uh, it can still be found in dictionaries, if anybody uses a dictionary. And that's Fibber McGee's Closet, which was a sound effect developed by NBC's sound staff, effects men Ed Booz and Virgil Reimer. That was actually the first time that the sound effect was used in 1940. Now in the movies, the closet gag looked like this. Are you ready? As soon as I get my hat, Jimmy. Hurry up, Molly. This is the most important meeting since 
inside the chamber of the president of commerce. President of the chamber of commerce. Where's my speech? In your portfolio. Yeah, I know, but where's my portfolio? Oh, I know. It's right here in the hall of life. Straighten out that cloud for me, days. I personally believe that if there's one aspect of Fibber McGee and Molly program that contributed to a success, it was that group of actors and the character actors who portrayed them. Jim Jordan was interviewed by Chuck Shaden for his book, Speaking of Radio. And in that interview, he indicated that each of the characters uh, was only to be in the program one time and they would uh, judge the audience reaction to uh, the character to decide if it would reappear. The list of characters that were repeated is long, but in my view, there were just a few who uh, became memorable. Of all the characters developed on Fibber McGee and Molly, uh, Harold Perry benefited, uh, I think, the most. He began his career in radio as a singer in his native California, but moved to Chicago to pursue his acting career. Uh, becoming, before becoming uh, Throckmorton, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, the neighbor of the McGee's. He appeared as a uh, pharmacist, a sales clerk, a doctor, but it was his portrayal of Gildersleeve that earned him the spin-off program, The Adventures of the Great Gildersleeve, which he starred in that for eight years. And although McGee and Gildersleeve were buddies, the dialogue between them often gave the opposite impression. Now, I'm going to have to... All right, uh, let's go back. My little audio is covered up here. Let me see how I can uh, get to it. No, it's not what I need to do. Oh, let's see this. No. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Sorry, here I can't get to the little uh, icon because everybody's covering it up. Is uh, it that one um, that looks like a little speaker over to the side? Is it that? Yes, but it's it's covered up by everyone's picture on my screen. So do you activate it? So. <laughs> Trying to figure out how I can get to it. Chris! Excuse me a minute, I'm gonna ask Chris. Chris! Hey. My little icon is buried under the people here. How do I get, how do I? Uh... Your icon. There you go. Go over in the top of one left click and you can slide that whole group of people over. You're in here somewhere. Oh, okay. Oh. What did you, what you just said? No, no. I have to get this up because my little icon for the audio is underneath there. Ah, you had it. There we go. All right. Better? No, because uh, now. All right, you want the that one? Yeah, which is it? This Not that one. This one? No. Nope. This next one. one. All right. All right. No. <laughs> there. Damn. Thank you. I'm glad Chris is here. Uh, what? 
Swimming? Well, swimming at this time of the year? Yes, we use the pool in your basement. What? Yeah. What are you talking about? We haven't got a swimming pool in our basement. Have you looked lately? <laughs> Because of his many radio and television roles, the best remembered character actor on Fibber McGee and Molly would probably be Gail Gordon. Gordon was born to a show business mother, Gloria Gordon. You may know her uh, from my friend Irma as Mrs. O'Reilly, the landlady. An early role for Gordon uh, on radio was Flash Gordon. He was also the announcer for Jack Haley on the Wonder Bread show, where he first teamed up uh, with Lucille Ball, who was a regular on the Haley show. In addition to his roles on Fibber McGee and Molly, Gordon was simultaneously Principal Osgood Conklin on Armist Brooks, neighbor Rumson Bullard on The Great Gildersleeve, and George's boss, Rudolph Atterbury, on My Favorite Husband, where he again teamed up with Lucille Ball. He repeated his Conklin role on television's Armist Brooks and appeared with Lucille Ball in her TV programs, The Lucille Ball Show, and Here's Lucy. Gordon's mark on Fibber McGee and Molly was made as mayor of Wistful Vista, Mayor Latrivia. Often aided by Molly, Fibber loved to engage with Latrivia in wordplay that usually led Gordon doing his famous slow burn. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Mr. McGee. Hello, McGee. Hi, City Father. What's all the <laughs> Uh, when I was over here for dinner the other evening, McGee, I lost my Phi Beta Kappa key. Uh, did you find the Phi Beta Judge? No. No, we didn't find any keys, Mr. Mayor. Did you lose your whole key ring or just the one key? Uh, just my Phi Beta Kappa key, Mr. McGee. Uh, it was pinned on my vest. Pinned on your vest? I think I'm away to carry the key, Mr. Mayor. How do you carry your money? Tied into a corner of your hanky? <laughs> Please, McGee, let's be sensible. A Phi Beta key is usually pinned on the vest. Well, uh, what was it a key to, Mr. Mayor? It wasn't the key to anything, Mr. Mead. It was the visible symbol of my membership in the honorary scholastic fraternity, Phi Beta Kappa. Oh, a key to the fat house. <laughs> I didn't get it at first, Mr. Mead. I thought the was... Apparently, McGee, you still don't get it. This key has no utilitarian purpose whatsoever. Oh, well, and what good is it? <laughs> For that matter, what good is that American Legion button your husband is wearing? What do you mean, what good is it, you big lint head? It shows I belong to the Legion. You think I wore it to get you in from blowing through the buttonhole? <laughs> Understand, dearie? Sure. 
means he can't get into the five minute capsule clubhouse without using his key. <laughs> they give all the members a key when they unlock the door. This key does not unlock any door. Can't you get that pipe through you on the end of the lock? <laughs> <laughs> My what? Never mind. Please keep an eye out for my key, if you will. It's a small bit, about a half an inch in diameter. Oh, you mean that's no. what the pin looks like that was on the key? That is the key. The key is a pin. <laughs> Maybe you better make the trivia a cup of hot tea, Molly. I don't want a cup of tea. I just want to find my tea. I mean, my husband. No, I don't either. Now, I'm, now, I'm, now, I'm, now, let's not all get excited, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure that we'll find your little pin with the key still on the key when we do. But, Mrs. McKinney, there is no key. It's just a pin. They just call it a key. Well, if you got to unpin it every time you don't want to unlock the clubhouse door, the clubhouse has not any door. There isn't any clubhouse. The key doesn't unlock anything because it isn't a key. It's a pin. I just wear it. By the time Gail Gordon joined the Coast Guard in World War II, Harold Peary had already left uh, to do the Great Gildersleeve. So the writers needed another character for Fibber to play off of. Thus came the character Dr. George Gamble, played by Arthur Hugh Bryan. Bryan began his career in radio as a singer, then morphed into an announcer at two radio stations in my birthplace of Philadelphia before beginning his acting career. While playing Doc Gamble, Brian also played jolly boy Barbara Floyd Munson on the Gildersleeve program. Brian is also well known as the original voice of Elmer Fudd in the Warner Brothers Looney Tune cartoons. And while you knew Fibber and Doc Gamble really cared for one another, sometimes you couldn't be sure by the bombastic name calling they engaged in. Gamble, you come in. Thanks, Molly. Hello, Buckle Ward. <laughs> Hi, a fever chart. Going out in the air show this hat? I might, though I'm a little tired of flying. Mm. With all the medical conventions I've flown to this year, I've taken off on more runways than Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> and with much less applause. Himself, he used to do a little flying himself, Doctor. A likely story. Why, he wouldn't get into an elevator without a complete weather report. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. I was one of the first pilots in this country, thermometer puss. And before they had all those sissy instruments, too. I learned to fly by the seat of my pants, and that was a big thing in them days. <laughs> in your case, it's a big thing now. <laughs> now, just a darn minute, Phil Butcher. If you knew as much about medicine as I know about aviation, you'd be in jail for malpractice right now. <laughs> Wait a minute, is that what I meant? <laughs> Boys, and I do mean boys, because you both act like you're playing hooky from the third grade. Why don't you two stop insulting each other and act like grown-up men? Uh, dear, you're, you're quite right. My apologies, McGee. Mm. If you say so, you are the greatest airplane pilot who ever lived. You could set a constellation down on a badminton court and do 8,000 consecutive outside loops in a concrete glider. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. I have a high opinion of you also. I think you're probably the finest physician who ever shook down a thermometer instead of a rich patient. <laughs> Thank you, my boy. I hope I'll have the great privilege of seeing you fly sometime. Thank you, Doctor. Now, sometime I may honor you by letting you excellent with me with my clothes on. <laughs> I know you wouldn't take unfair advantage by diagnosing my walk. <laughs> Thank you. I sincerely trust you. Oh, for goodness sake, stop <laughs> This is worse than the other way. <laughs> Go ahead and call each other names. Okay. Look, Melon Belly. <laughs> Did you say you were going to be out the air show? Why, sure, ground loop. If you're going to follow around those airplanes, let me give you a little advice. What's that, Doctor? Don't walk into any whirling propellers. They'll give you a splitting headache. Oh. See you later. <laughs> Hey, 
Every show, of course, needed a female foil as well. And that character on Fibber, Fibber McGee and Molly was Abigail Uppington, the wannabe scion of Wistful Vista's upper crust. Her backstory, however, was that she had not come from wealth, but had been a horseback performer in the circus. An accident at the circus landed her in the lap of the wealthy Mr. Uppington, who promptly proposed to her. Uppy, as she was referred to, was expertly portrayed by Isabel Randolph, a veteran of radio and the movies, who later performed in hundreds of TV programs, mostly in characters similar to that of her character on Fibber, McGee, and Molly. Many of Fibber's barbs regarding Uppy were spoken to Molly as Uppy entered the house. Many innuendos were part of the conversations between Uppy and the McGees. During the War Years, they added another female character, Alice Darling, played by Shirley Mitchell. Alice was a young, boy-happy war factory worker who roomed with the McGees. At the same time she was playing Alice, Shirley was playing Leela Ransom, the widow with the syrupy southern voice on The Great Gildersleeve. I had the pleasure of speaking with Shirley Mitchell at one of the last Friends of Old Time radio conventions, and she was delightful. She once mentioned in an interview uh, that her second husband, Jay Livingston, had written the Christmas song, Silver Bells, which she jokingly said was their annuity. So having met her, listening to her is one of my guilty pleasures, along with dark chocolate and Coca-Cola. So the first little snippet is Shirley as Leela, and then uh, as Alice mm -hmm. Darling. Oh, that's 
set up for this next one is uh, River McGee and Molly are out looking for a Christmas tree. Uh, they've waited till the last minute and they bump into Alice. my opinion of all the secondary characters on Fibber, McGee, and Molly, it was Bill Thompson who, over the long run of the program, contributed the most memorable characters. The restaurant owner, Nick Topopoulos, W.C. Field, Soundalike, Horatio K. Boomer, the hard of hearing old timer, and the milk toast Wallace Wimple. A little background on Thompson. He was born William H. Thompson in Terre Haute, Indiana on July 8th, 1913. His parents were involved in theater playing in musical comedies in vaudeville. At an early age, Thompson showed a talent for mimicry. He made his first professional appearance in this theater at the age of two. At five, he was performing in vaudeville with his parents. And although he was still just a kid, during World War I, he performed for the sick and wounded members of the military. While attending high school in Chicago, he organized theater clubs and wrote and directed plays. During the Chicago World's Fair, NBC conducted a radio audition contest. Thompson was one of 5,000 entrants. He prepared and performed a skit using 10 dialects. The director was so pleased by Thompson's work that within a week of the audition contest, Thompson appeared on the National Farm and Home Hour. 
1934, he became a member of the cast of the NBC Jamboree. He followed that up by joining the cast of Don McNeil's popular morning show, NBC's The Breakfast Club. My mic's muted. Um, what happened to the lamps that were around the window? What happened to the vine? Also performing on The Breakfast Club were Chickie and Toots. They were played by Jim and Marion Jordan. And it was during the 1934-35 season of The Breakfast Club that Thompson introduced the character of Mr. Wimple. In 1935, the Jordans began their long running show and it was not long after that that Thompson joined their cast. The character of Nick Topopoulos was the owner of a Wistful Vista restaurant, Greek of course, and a friend of the McGee's. He was clearly an ethnic stereotype, one who was having difficulties with the English language. Thompson always didn't play characters. There were some times that he used his natural voice. And here are a couple of examples of that. Uh, the first one, Fibber and Molly are riding on the local trolley. There's a contest. And Thompson, uh, he's hilarious as a streetcar conductor. And uh, Mayor of the Trivia happens to get on the trolley as well. This audio is a little bit rough, but uh, it's the best I could find. And I think it's worth straining a bit to, uh, to hear. It's, uh, it's good. No. Well, it's, uh, 
This next one, uh, Thompson plays Mr. Fosdick. He's the clerk in the dry cleaners. Thompson character Horatio K. Boomer was a con man through and through, usually with a scam of some kind going on. Boomer had a voice which was clearly modeled after W.C. Fields. Store. Well, heavenly days, is that really? Sure, Horatio K. Boomer. Oh, 
I haven't seen him for two or three years. Hi, Boomer, old man. Hello, Mr. Boomer. Well, 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 if it isn't the girl of my dreams, the boy of my nightmare. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here of all places. McGee is the name, is it not? That's right, Boomer. Hey, where have you been all this time? We haven't seen you around for quite a while, Mr. Boomer. No, I've been busy helping the government. Helping the government what? Helping them make $5 bills. <laughs> Was I appreciated? No, just apprehended. <laughs> Well, you've no doubt learned a lesson, Mr. Boomer. Now you can go straight. Exactly what I told the magistrate, my dear, my very words. You told him you'd go straight? No, I told him he could go straight and where. <laughs> he didn't take the advice in a kindly spirit. Being a literary fellow, he threw the book at me. Ah, oh, well, but you seem to be in sort of some sort of trouble, my boy. Anything I can do to alleviate the situation? No, thank you, Mr. Boomer. He's been fighting with this weighing machine. I put a penny in and got nothing. I can't even get my dough back, Boomer. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you mustn't fight a coin collecting machine, son. Repositories for money must be coaxed. <laughs> Come to think of it. Come to think of it, I have my little coaxer right here with me. Now, let me see now, where did I put that coaxer? Oh, dear. Here we go again. I must have it here someplace. Uh, what's this? Oh, yes, a bottle of invisible ink yeah. for writing checks on my invisible checking account. <laughs> yes, here's a very expensive stethoscope. Fine instrument it is, too. Studying medicine, Boomer? No, studying the people in the next hotel room to mine. Just put this little device against the wall and listen. Ah, oh, what have we here? <laughs> oh, yes, a small skeleton key. In case somebody wants a small skeleton open sometime. <laughs> Here's a pair of dice. Ah, don't jar them, they're loaded. <laughs> Here's a membership card and boogie of the month club. <laughs> Fine premium this month, too. Daily double at Pimlico. And a check for short beer. <laughs> well, well, imagine that. No culture. So if you'll excuse a hasty departure, I think I'll be getting along. Just have time to get to the jewelry store after they close. Cheer on, chick The populace and Boomer didn't appear weekly, and the populace kind of faded during the uh, early years of the show but Boomer continued throughout most of it. There were two Thompson characters in the heyday of the program that almost appeared every week. The beloved characters, the old timer and Wallace Winfall. The old timer was actually the first character Thompson created for Fibber, McGee and Molly when he joined it in 1935. In addition to being hard of hearing, the old timer tended to distort jokes, usually preceding his comments with the catchphrase, that ain't the way I heard it. Although he refers to Fibber and Molly as Johnny and daughter, there was no apparent reason for it. It was only shortly before the end of the program that the old timer's real name was revealed as Adelton P. Bagshaw. You were a 
acquainted with me, Uncle Dennis. I suppose they met in the revolving door and started going around together. <laughs> that takes me back to my childhood, Johnny. They didn't have revolving doors when you were a child. No, but they had that joke. <laughs> and furthermore, that ain't the way I hear it. Well, I hear it from her side to tell her. <laughs> she went the territory of Hawaii, voted to become our 49th state. That's who, says Tabitha. Pretty close contest? No, says the first brother. Them hula girls knew they could swing it. Where'd you say uh, Denny was? Uh, he's gone home, old timer, said he with a glad drive. <laughs> what do you want to see him about, Mr. Old Timer? No, oh, he was taking me to a taxi dance tonight, daughter. But I didn't want to go. Why not? Don't care for taxi dancing, Johnny. Oh. Tried it once and kept getting my hip pockets caught in the door handle. <laughs> Although Thompson had created the character of Wallace Wimple during his time at the Breakfast Club, it wasn't until five years after joining the Jordans that the Wimple character was introduced to the Fibber McGee and Molly show. Using a voice that would pay his bills for years to come, Thompson's Wallace Wimple was perhaps radio's greatest example of a henpecked, milquetoast husband. In today's world, the actions of his big old wife, Sweetie Face, as Wimple described him, would have labeled him as an abused spouse. Sweetie Face was never heard, the concept was so comical, though, that it was copied to a degree by the Mr. Postman character that appeared routinely on the Burns and Allen show. Come in. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Oh, hi, Wimp. Hello, Mr. Wimple. How are you today? Oh, I feel just peachy, Mrs. McGee. I should. I've just finished up my setting up exercises. You're setting up exercises? Yes. I've been setting up in the attic waiting for sweet things to go <laughs> She hunted all over the house for me and she couldn't find me. She had to start looking up the chimney. What were you hiding for, Mr. Wimble? Oh, sweet face was mad at me. Somebody sent her an awfully nasty valentine. She thought I did it. Mm -hmm. Who did send it? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Why, Mr. Wimple, that was me. Uh, I hope it wasn't you who sent one to Mrs. Uppington. Oh, no, Mrs. McGee. I wouldn't do anything like that. I'm very fond of Mrs. Uppington. You mean you think more of her than you do of your own wife? At times. <laughs> what times? Old oh, times, like from when... Sweetie Face and I were married up till now. Say, how are you getting along with your bodybuilding exercises, Miss Wimple? Just wonderfully, Mrs. McGee. Sweetie Face says if I keep it up, I'm going to look like that man on the back of the magazine. You mean Charles Appas? Yes. Sweetie Face considers me an Appas even now. Oh, she does? Yes. She tried to shove me into the top shelf of the bookcase this morning. <laughs> Mr. Wimple, I really don't the way that woman treats you. She's a horrible woman. Oh, you mustn't talk about sweet things like that, Mrs. McGee. Oh, nobody can hear us. You sure? Sure. All right. Then let's all talk about it. <laughs> Look, Mr. Wimple, why don't you leave home and get a job as a, uh, uh, what were some of those jobs, McGee? Oh, he hasn't had any training in them, Molly. There's a, there are skilled labor jobs. You ever had any experience in plate hanging with? Oh, yes, indeed. Oh. Just this morning, Sweetie Face hung a plate on me that almost... <laughs> no, no, that's one of the jobs that's needed in war production, Mr. Wimple. You see... Oh, do you have to go? Oh, yes, I'm a face, too, Mrs. McGee. Sweetie Face is due home any minute now to start dinner, and I left the gas turned on in the kitchen. Her house is simply full of gas fumes. Boy, she's liable to blow herself to pieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Oh, hello, Mr. Wimple. Terrible weather, isn't it? 
isn't it? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. McGee. I really don't mind the snow. I find it rather inspiring. <laughs> me too, Imp. It inspires me to stay inside with my slippers on. <laughs> I think he means poetically, dearie. Don't you, Mr. Wimple? Yes, Mrs. McGee. I love to sit in the park on a snow, snow, snowy day and feed the squirrels and think of poems. <laughs> Have you batted out any beautiful ballads of late winter? I just wrote one this afternoon, Mr. McGee. I call it To My Dear Wife. Oh. How sweet. It must be wonderful to have a husband who writes poetry to you. What do you mean it must be? I used to write poetry to you. I know, dearie, but that was free verse. <clears throat> oh. Did Mr. McGee write free verse, Mrs. McGee? Yes. He took it freely from Longfellow, Byron, and Burns. <laughs> well, he was a great poet, that Byron. I still think he should have been president. Oh, he couldn't have been, Mr. McGee. He was an Englishman. What are you talking about? Williams, Jennings, Byron was an Englishman? <laughs> Come on, Wimp. Skip it, McGee. I want to hear Mr. Wimple's poem to his dear wife. How does it go, Mr. Wimple? Oh, it's just a simple little thing. <laughs> it goes to my dear wife. <laughs> I wish I was a little squirrely. Oh, that wish is granted. We've <laughs> got two more coming. Quiet, McGee. Go oh, on, Mr. Wimple. I wish I was a little squirrely, frisking in the trees so early, chattering down at passerbys and throwing pigs down in their eyes. <laughs> Stamping gaily here and there, leaping gracefully through the air, storing food up three whole seasons to last through winter, and other reasons, every one of which I often brew, so when I climb down to dig up food and bring back breakfast to my wife, so true, I can say, here, sweetheart, nuts to you. Mr. Wimple. Sweetie Face? Oh, I haven't shown it to her, Mrs. McGee. Besides, she isn't much for modern poetry. She likes limerick. Ever write her any limericks, Wimp? Oh, I started to once. I wrote, there once was a woman named Sweetie Face, whose figure had many a meaty place. <laughs> well? Yes, I am now. <laughs> but I was laid up for weeks and weeks. Look at mine now. <laughs> Thompson's popularity on Fibber McGee and Molly earns him his own uh, show, his own opportunity for a show. And much like uh, the Dennis Day, Life in the Dennis Day, uh, Thompson played a fictionalized version of himself. But he did the program without his characters, and it was short-lived. Uh, by 1942, Thompson's roles with the Georges were well established. It was then that Thompson began his long-term relationship with MGM cartoon maker Tex Avery. Avery used Thompson's wimple voice in more than 20 cartoons of the character Droopy. In 1951, Thompson established a relationship with the Disney studio when he was the voice for the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. He voiced for Disney Mr. Snee and other pirates in Peter Pan, King Hubert in Sleeping Beauty, and in Lady and the Tramp, he provided five voices. In 1960, television was about to put on its first primetime cartoon, The Flintstones. And Thompson was selected to play the part of Fred Flintstone. But after recording the first five episodes of the show, Thompson couldn't maintain the gravelly voice that Hannah Barbara wanted. So he was replaced by Alan Reed. And Alan Reed, in fact, re recorded the first five episodes. But Hannah Barbara found a part for Thompson later in the 1960s with the character of Touche Turtle. Thompson's voice acting parts became sporadic in the latter part of the 60s as Thompson expanded his career as an executive with the Union Oil Company. His final voice appearance was in Disney's Aristocrats in 1970. Tragically, Thompson died in 1971 at the age of 58. And while it was reported by some sources that it was a heart attack, apparently he actually died of acute septic shock from the surgery that he had. Well, a number of you know that I'm a real fan of OTR trivia. So the last piece I'm going to play for you is trivia to the nth degree. We all know Wallace Wimple had a wife that he called Sweetie Face, but did she have a given name? Here's the setup. There's a section of roadway in Wistful Vista that's been repaved. Fibber has walked on it and got stuck. He's been stuck for hours without a solution. Have you had enough to eat now, McGee? Not quite. Off we 
me one more cookie. Thanks. How about you, McGee? You want some more? No, oh, thanks, Gildersleeve. You can pull in the hose now. <laughs> hey, when is this guy coming up to get me out of here? You mean the man who invented the saving material? <laughs> He's doing it. Probably the only time in the long run of Fibber, McGee, and Molly that the name Cornelia was mentioned as Sweetie Face's given name. While the actors who played them are now all gone, fortunately for those of us who were fans of old time radio, the voices of the characters who roamed through Wistful Vista have and will continue to live on. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Here we go. There we are. There we are. I'm back. <laughs> hey, you got your power back, Wendy. Yes, I got my power back. I'm very pleased. But with the, through the miracles of Zoom technology, I was able to telephone in so I could hear all of the first 15 and all of that and the first part of Frank's uh, presentation. This is what I love about this platform. Anyway. All right, well, Sally, your host, so you can now give us the answers to the trivia quiz. Yes. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Frank. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you. All right. Are we ready? <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. All right. I've got the uh, poll results, which I'm going to share. So everyone can see how people voted. All right, you should be able to see the results on the screen and I'm going to go through the answers. Number one, 
was all about that popular quiz show that had three regular panelists, John Kieran, Franklin P. Adams, and Oscar Levant, plus a guest, and that was called Information, Please. Number two, Tonto would usually be finding, would be writing what animal? An unnamed mule, scout, white feller, or any of the above? Well, 62% of us were fooled into picking a single answer, but 38%, eight of us, were not. Any one of the above is the correct answer. In some 1933 episodes, Tonto rode an unnamed mule or a jackass. By 1935, he was riding a pale horse named Whitefeller. In 1938, his mount was then an Indian pony named Scout, and that continued until the series went off the air. Well, a dog might fit. Number three. This is about Virginia Payne, who had the leading role on a soap opera on both NBC and CBS. And she was the highest paid soap opera actor. And the name of her long running program was, I hope most of us, and yes, we did pick Ma Perkins. Very good. C, Ma Perkins. Number four, Frederick Ziv's company produced many successful shows, but we wanted to know the one that was not his. We were pretty evenly spread here. Nobody picked Boston Blackie, but nine of us picked Fox 13, eight picked the Cisco Kid, and four picked Bold Venture. Which one was not Frederick Zibbs, Fox 13 with Alan Ladd was produced by Mayfair Transcriptions, which also produced the Damon Runyon Theater. So the correct answer was B. I got that. Number five, Gene Autry's horse, famous in the movies, not on radio. But the horse got its own show. What was that horse's name? Let's see how many of us thought it was. Runner up? Nobody. Bronze medalist? Nobody. One thought it might be Sora Loser, but most of us could not be fooled. The horse's name was Champion. A. Okay. Number six. Oh, we have an explanation. Oh, 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 man. Sorry, Jack. Oh, I got too excited. The Adventures of Champion aired on Mutual for six months in 1949. Gene Autry was not in the show, and his horse was voiced by Dave Light, who also did all of the animal sounds on Melody Ranch. Fun. Number six. We're looking at the quiz programs. Which quiz program was the first to air nationally? This was a tough one based on our answers. We were so evenly spread here. Seven for Dr. IQ, four for Pot of Gold, four for Vox Pop, and six for Double or Nothing. Well, the answer, the four of you that picked C are the big winners. The answer is C, Vox Pop in 1935. Dr. IQ went national, 1939. Double or Nothing, 1940. And Pot of Gold in 1941. Hmm. Number seven. What do all of these towns have in common? I really want to go visit the waterfalls at Pine Ridge, Gene Autry and Truth or, truth or con Consequences? Just kidding. That's not the right answer. Neither was it that all of them only permit left-handed people on their city council, for better or worse. And 
Not a single one of those was ever a state capital. Good thing nobody fell for that one. But most of us did know that they all acquired their current name in connection with the radio show. The correct answer is C, which I think is really cool. Okay, number eight. This was hard to not just do normal. <laughs> I wanted to actually play the quiz this time, so I said I wasn't going to read it through. I was just going to do it. And then this one nearly tripped me up, Jack. You nearly got me. Because Yukon 28209 is so easy, it just rolls right off the tongue. But when you have to mix all those numbers up, oh my goodness. So the correct answer for number eight, Wendy Matson's apartment telephone number is Yukon 28209. B. So it looks like I wasn't the only one who got tripped up. So. Number nine. Oval Team sponsored which kids show? Sky Queen? I wish. That sounds really cool. Colonel Mustard? I love Clue. I'd listen to that too. Dudley Do Right? Nah. But it's Captain Mid. D. And the last question, which I think is going to be the most challenging. George Gershwin's radio program, Music by Gershwin, was first on NBC Blue, then on CBS. Who was his announcer and his sponsor? Was it Milton Cross? and Brunswick Records, kind of us thought so. Makes sense because music, records, hmm? Was it Ken Carpenter and Bell Telephone? Four of us thought so. Was it Don Wilson and Phenomit Laxative Chewing Gum? <laughs> or was it Hugh James and Metropolitan Life Insurance? Mm. The correct answer is, drum roll please, C, Don Wilson and Phenomit Laxative Chewing Gum. Oh, yes, man. It's true. George Gershwin was sponsored by a laxative, and he had the same announcer as Jack Ben. Wow. You fooled us on that one, Jim. <laughs> well done, Jack. Excellent questions all around. And I got to play, too, and didn't do too bad. Hope you all had fun. Great stuff. Shall we unmute? There, I'm unmuted. <laughs> that was a good meeting. Jim. Yeah. Now we can proceed to have social pandemonium until the meeting is over. Pandemonium, 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 pandemonium. Right. Pandering to monium. Should there be yes. a boo if it's pandemonium? <laughs> ah, pandemonium. <laughs> Panda may be pregnant. Right. Cindy, you, uh, Sally, you might want to unmute people. I think only the host can do it. I don't have that power. You're the host. I think she did. Well, no, everyone is pretty much muted. Everyone should be able to unmute themselves. Looks like uh -huh. everyone here is unmuted. Except oh, oh. Maybe they don't want to be unmuted. Linnell, I want to tell you, I love that top. I want to rip it right off your back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it's just, it's beautiful. It's just such a beautiful color, and it, it's just such a happy color. It's great stuff. Ooh. From my red hat group. Oh. May I ask a question? Hi, can I, may I ask a question? You just did. Yes, uh, please no. do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, what I wanted to know, because uh, I got interrupted, my audio was interrupted at one point. There's only one uh of the the other secondary characters i didn't hear and i just want to know if, if if it was presented or not that i was expecting to hear 
uh, in the presentation was the little girl. Did, did you show her? Because she was on a lot, you know, that was supposed to be really stupid. I can't think of her name. No, I didn't, I didn't include her because I didn't consider her necessarily to be a secondary character. It was Marion Jordan who, who did the part. And I was more interested in some of the other uh, actors. Oh, uh, I, was, I missed her because, you know, she's, I mean, she's, she's not one of the two main characters. It's a second, it's a different character. You know what I mean? She should have been included. Well, I'll tell you what, if I ever present it again somewhere, I will include the team. Okay. Sure. Well, you know, I, I this was a heavy on all the males. We needed I, more females. I thought the little girl was actually Molly doing a doing a little girl's voice. Am I correct? Yes. yes. You are. Yes. And and we, we do learn her name in one episode also, Teeny's actual real name. In the episode where the Valentine card is sent. I think it's Christmas card, but yeah, same thing. Yes. You mean it wasn't I Betcha? Nope. Thank you. <laughs> Were all of the shows done in front of a, a live audience? Until the early 1950s, when they went to a 15-minute program, the half-hour shows were done in front of a live audience. And candidly, if you listen to the 15-minute shows, they're not as good because you don't get the reaction uh, that you did. I mean, you, when you're listening to those snippets that I played, you could hear that the uh, audience, you know, really enjoyed it. I'm, it's a shame that the audio on the one where uh, Bill Thompson's the conductor uh, isn't that good because the audience is just laughing out loud the whole time and uh, most of it. So yeah, the, the, you know, as I said, a live audience made the show. Oh, it's a great, great program. Thank you very much. Yes. There you, and you worked so hard on it. And Frank, it was a great show. And thank you for the pictures, because we often see the pictures of uh, Fibber McGee and Molly, but I haven't seen Isabel uh, uh, Randolph or a few of the others. So it's great to see their faces as well. No, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I enjoyed finding them and uh, being able to put them up. Thanks, Edgar. You bet. Did you know that Fibber McGee did a few shows after Molly died? Yeah, he, back. he did he much did. like George Burns did some shows after uh, after Burns and Allen on television. Uh, he did some, but again, they just weren't you know the same. Uh, didn't have the same uh, result as uh, as with Molly. And of course, you know, he did some for a few years for a year or so when she was indisposed. We'll say. Uh, uh, the 30s, yeah. Yeah. How was she disposed? I'm sorry? She asked about being indisposed. I've heard several stories. Can you shed any light on that? Well, what I've read, what I've read and understood is that she had a problem with alcohol and uh, she uh, the time away from the show to uh, get straightened out with the alcohol. I see. It, in fact, I think that may have been what killed her, Frank, if I remember right, too. Yeah, she died. But, she died much younger than uh, than yeah. uh, he did. The, the liver, yeah. I mean, he, he actually remarried and had a, a second marriage that lasted uh, a long time as well after she passed away. Yep. <laughs> Is his voice in the rescuers? Yes. He's in the original Rescuers. Is that the last thing he did, or did he do things after that? I don't remember. Do you remember, Frank? No, I don't. I don't, Jeff. The second Rescuers, because that was a couple years later. No, the, the second Rescuers is John Candy as the as the albatross, and the first Rescuers is uh, Jim Jordan as the albatross. That that's the play. A Disney animated movie. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I, I recently rewatched it. I hadn't seen it in years, you know, and I was trying to watch some Disney movies that I hadn't seen in a long time. I was like, ah! <laughs> I know that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was very funny. Yeah. And that's one of those movies you don't hear about that much. And it was it was good. It was yeah. very oh, yeah. good. Oh, I'm scary. <laughs> Very definitely. Wow, I'm, I'm, my hat is off to you for the work you 
did not only in research, Frank, but what it took to compile the, you know, the program to put the whole thing together. Well, it was thank great you. stuff. I, it, it was, uh, you know, it was fun to do, uh, to find the little pieces that I thought would fit and, uh, you know, to put it together was, uh, it was fun. Particularly, we've had a lot of time without any sports on television. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how much extra time one has, and yet I, for one, am not accomplishing that much in all that extra time. So I don't know about the rest of you. I have a great to-do list, <laughs> but I haven't touched it in five months. So, <laughs> but I keep hoping. <laughs> well, I'd like to know if Frank uh, will finally tell us what's behind door number one, door number two, and door number three. <laughs> <laughs> my, my left, my left is the living room. <laughs> my right is the family room, and it's not for Bernadine's closet, but <laughs> no! don't open that closet, McGee. <laughs> wow, now that's an organized closet. I'm impressed. <laughs> Only you were there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. You can't, you can't see them, but uh, the bookshelves in front of me are all full, so that's why they're all piled up in the closet, those that I still have to get to. Uh -huh. Ah, very good. Ah, organizational tools, gotta love them. Well, I'm going to say goodnight because Chris wants to take apart the... Uh, my microphone, his microphone, and the camera, and go home because he's got a little one at home. And uh, you know, I appreciate Chris again. You're taking the time to come out and and do this for me. So, uh, yes. Thanks. Yes, I think we all appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Frank. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off and say goodnight and hope everybody is well till next month. All right, right back at you. <laughs> Fine. I head up to. So. Good night. Bye. Good night. Yeah, everybody. You... Nice to see everybody. Edgar, I'm glad you got to see me. I'm glad I got to see you too. <laughs> Looking good. Yeah. 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 We've got a good. See you later. <laughs> great collection. So I had a camera that worked. You'd, Thanks you'd for see me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. Well, at least we get to hear you. So guess... you know that's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> bye, guys. bye 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 thanks bye. for the quiz sally i'm glad bye, you're feeling better fingers crossed they figure out nope i don't oh i have this all right there i'm making you the official host wendy and i'm happy oh oh this is like a tag you it situation <laughs> fred is the co-host so it, it's good stuff well um <laughs> night all I guess. Good night. Take Wendy, it easy. Wendy, let's let's just stay on until next month. Uh, <laughs> well, you could do it. This link will be live all, you know, until I actually delete it. So Oh, I see. <laughs> so, you know, I mean you could take it and do whatever you want with it. Um hopefully nothing too dastardly. But yeah, we could. We could just hang out for the next month and uh I might have to hop off to set up the link to the next meeting for the group, but <laughs> I, I understand. We, no. we could do some Zoom acting. We ought to do a Zoom uh, radio play. We should. We should do a we, reenactment. No question. I think I think that would be really cool if we could um, plan maybe a reenactment on Zoom uh, for the club. You know, that might be that might be kind of jolly to to do. Oh, you absolutely. Know. I mean, a lot of theater companies and people are doing that, just that kind of thing, you know, where they're using Zoom to do performances and put together things. But uh, yeah, that would be that would be a fun thing to do. Something to think about, Jeff, or Edgar. Or somebody. Yeah. Are you, are you doing any Zoom, uh, Wendy? Oh, are you doing uh, any Zoom, Zoom acting? I'm, doing, I'm not zoom acting but i am doing a lot of zoom yes yeah me too uh, spooky action theater you know i'm on 
I'm the chairman of the board there. So, you know, trying to keep a live theater company going during a pandemic is challenging to say the least. Oh but, yeah. You think? <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I've, I've, you know, been hooked on to zoom and, and, uh, it's a great tool. It's a great way to stay connected, I think. Did I, didn't my buddy, Mr. John, John Abbott already log off? Did he, yeah. the, let me see, I can, I have my master list. I, I think he's gone. Yes, he's already jumped off. That bomb. <laughs> I, I, will, I, I will have to figure out what to do with him later. Margie and I yeah, have to talk about it's too. not like he has to get back on the road to drive home. I know. That's why I can't understand why he's gone already. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's all zoomed out. I was talking to my 10-year-old grandson um, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, all spring his school did everything over Zoom. He's in a private school, so they did it really well. But he spent the entire day. He had an entire day of classes and everything on Zoom. And so I said to him, just to make conversation, so, um, you know, do you, do you spend any time on Zoom? And he rolled his eyes. He wears glasses, so he looks like this real bookworm. And he rolled his eyes to the ceiling and said, I am so tired of Zoom. <laughs> 10 years old. I mean, good Lord. How do you get tired of anything at 10 years old? <laughs> But anyway, I'm just I'm, I'm waiting to meet the Bushes for dinner. That's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, well, they 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 entertain in their kitchen, so we, well, we like you know, to watch. We can watch. We, we got to go to the diner. I, I'm ready yeah. for. A we we could have a Zoom dinner party. There we go. Well, you could do a virtual background with the diner, every one of you, so you would have the feeling that That's you were right. in the in the uh, <laughs> diner. There you go. I like Not a bad idea. Yeah, but I really need some chicken fried steak or something. You know, I I, I can have diner food. <laughs> yeah. Wait, just 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 pick it up, pick it up, take it home, and then we can all have our own favorites. Yes, maybe they'll give you. Maybe you can do it for takeout. Of course, it's not next door to you, but you know. Well, the, the Bob and Edith's is pretty close, so. Oh well, that's not bad. Well then, yeah. there you go. There you go. And the question is, do they have chicken fried steak oh, that is... Of course. That's a good diner. <laughs> <laughs> you judge diners us. by the grease in their food. Come on. <laughs> and not only in their food, in their parking lot. You smell it before you even go in. Before That's you exactly even go right. through the door. And then you carry it with you into your car when you get back into your car. Because it's permeated your clothes. I mean, it's great stuff. <laughs> Keeps you well lubricated. Marcy, Marcy, you're, still, you're still muted if you want to talk. <laughs> you can unmute. Let's see. Well, I'll see you all next month. See you, Phil. You got to. Yes, gonna... it's great, and I'm looking forward to your program. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> just, this is wonderful stuff. I'm, I'm glad everyone's so enthusiastic about it. We may be doing this for a while longer. I'm going to say something. Uh, I'm going to be in a meeting with Jim Cox tomorrow. I know a lot of you know him. I'll say hello for everybody. Wonderful. Yeah. Please do. Great. Great stuff. Thank you. And Fred, thanks for recording. Fred, Fred signed on three times, so we've got him. He's on mute. Oh. Well, on two of his devices, he's on mute, but it looks like he's unmuting his fire pad. I Not see. sure. You're yes. right. You're oh, that's been connected. It, it inflates the numbers, the attendance numbers. So, you know. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to kind of. But, but, you know, I think having over 35 mem people participating per meeting is pretty respectable. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you get to see people from far away as well that you don't yes. always see. Yes, yes. It, it really is wonderful stuff. I'm really delighted. 
Well, there, yeah. there should be a way when we do go back to live meetings to have Zoom or have a camera that can broadcast the meeting to people all across the country. Our, our problem is, Edgar, has always been we don't have internet access down there. It, because of the basement, you don't get cell service. We don't have Wi-Fi from them. So that's what we've got to work on. We've, we've tried to do that from the church in the past. But, I, but now, I, can, can, you, can you broadcast it by a cell phone? I, no. I, I don't have Wi-Fi. All, they they like their money, so uh, you know I think that they'll they, they'll let they'll the groups let the back group. in, but it'll be a question of when and safety and you know. Yeah, how much uh, they want to clean up after us because they're going to have to disinfect everything on Friday night or Saturday morning or any you know, of that stuff. Just cause. Well, I mentioned they're not going to open before there's a vaccine, before people are actually vaccinated. I would imagine for groups. You know, they might, for for their own purposes, open sooner. But from that yes, point of view, you're probably right. But I don't so, think the churches are going to forget their groups. As I, I say, so. Episcopalians well, are very uh, tuned I, 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 in. Did you just volunteer your basement? Is that what you just did? <laughs> I don't have a basement. No, I Edgar. Live in, oh, Edgar. Ed, Edgar. Edgar. Yeah, I, I don't have a basement available either. Oh, uh, now, single guy like Someone's got to have a basement. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big club. <laughs> I, I'm nominating Edgar's. That's what I'm nominating. Yeah, well, yeah, if, if you want to have 50,000 cassette tapes down there, no, it's, it's filled with stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I should probably charge admission. Okay, so have it in your living room. I was trying to get out of the main house, but, you know, <laughs> if we have to have it upstairs, we'll have it upstairs. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Downtown, real convenient for everybody to get to. <laughs> there you go. They, I mean, I am loving not having to worry about what is the weather? Are there going to be storms? Do I have to drive? Where am I going to park? You know, I mean, yeah, we have parking and all of that, but if the weather's really nasty, don't really want to go out in it, you know? This is uh, very convenient. It's appealing to my lazy side. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Jim. Oh, that's good. That's... For about the last 20 minutes, I've been muted by the host. It said, you're muted by the host and you can't unmute yourself. I had to hang up and call back in again. Oh, my Goodness. Oh, I, I've no. asked all to unmute, but um, yeah, I, I well, kind that's of lost. Good. Now I know what the solution is for that problem. If it happens again, I have to hang up and call back in. Right. Or if you're on the phone, just hit star six. No, that's what it, when you try to do that, it work. says you've been muted by the host and you can't unmute yourself. Whoa, whoa, well, such yeah. power. Who knew? Yeah, such power. I do. I do. Yeah, I was surprised. Our theater group is actually uh, trying to. They're going to try to do a show this fall. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to do. Uh, they're going to do uh, Sondheim. Uh, Merrily we roll along. Oh, good which, lord! Uh, I watched it on uh, YouTube, and I said, "No thanks. I prefer my musicals like my beer. I want them to be light and sweet, not dark and bitter." <laughs> <laughs> Merrily, we roll along was not one of the uh, great successes that Sondheim had anyway. So you're well, probably not now that I've seen it, I think I, un I think I understand why. <laughs> <laughs> Many people have had that reaction, although I'm sure there are some tunes that are delightful from it. Oh, the but, music, the music. So it's, it's always wonderful. But the, the, the plot is just uh, two guys uh, kvetching at each other for two hours. It's, oh, it's, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Can do without that. Yeah. My goodness. Yes, that is a uh, 
quite a quite a problem. Yeah. Well, we were talking when you were muted. I don't know if you were trying to talk to us about the idea of trying to do a recreation on Zoom. Yeah, so, that would be a great idea. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I'm going to be up to my my uh, partner in crime. I'll see what he says. Yeah. See if you can figure something out. That might be kind of fun to try to do. Well, it 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 will happen. It's just a question of when. I don't know how long it'll take us, but we'll figure it out. Very good. <laughs> Well, now, that how, we're gonna, how we're going to get the sound effects crew to work, I don't know, but you know, we'll, we'll figure that out too. I've been thinking about that. As soon as you said it, I thought, no way. Yes. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. You don't even have I, to. I have the utmost faith in you, my friend. Absolutely. It's just one more challenge for your Even creativity. if I have to paint the house and do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Zoom I've got was a not... train whistle I bought in Ohio. If you need yeah. a train whistle, you know, one of the woo kind of train yeah. whistles. I've got one of those here. I've got a good school bell, an old brass school bell as well. Ah. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom was not designed for music or synchronized sound effects. So you'd have to work on the timing to make sure that the musical cues uh, you know, we're delivered uh, because it's 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 not synchronized. So we're seeing each other on delay. And when you're talking, it, it's not as important. But the music uh, does. If someone's providing music and somebody else is singing, there's a big problem. Uh, and this, I imagine the same for the sound effects. But there may be a way to compensate or to just delay your line after the sound effect for it to go through but it it can be solved but it's not perfect right. well, you probably don't want to do chairman of that committee say what i say let's make edgar the chairman of that committee uh, <laughs> well i think that the, don't you think that the solution is you don't try to talk over the sound effect i mean yeah. like you know because that might be a problem because you'll see it on zoom if two people try to speak simultaneously there's always kind of like if you're trying to recite a poem in unison yeah it's, yeah it's all over the place but you could use that for an intentional effect if you were I, doing I can something me now <laughs> i can hear it coming <laughs> use the chaos use the chaos okay. use the chaos that's i like it jim yeah. exactly use the chaos good <laughs> stuff hey dennis. dennis you look somewhat overwhelmed or perturbed i'm just waiting for the uh the announcement Are... of the meeting officially adjourned <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, you don't have to wait dennis you know you're you're, this is America. You're free to leave if you wish. Or, no, or he's just, well, he's I the recording. He's the recorder. He's the secretary. So oh, okay. He's taking yes. the he's minutes. He's taking notes on all of our uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have yes, as, as recorder, I have to note the time. So. <laughs> no. Well, you we, might we want to shave that. about twenty Let's... minutes off the time. <laughs> yeah. So you, yes. you need a uh, movement. Oh, I, to... I picked. You need a motion to uh, adjourn. So, so motion. Well, I mean, second. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I usually could have, you know, pick the time when when Frank left, but you know, that would be good. There you yeah. go. That well, that would well. work. <laughs> this this is just the social hour afterwards. This is yeah. This is the diner afterwards, right? Lou of going to the diner. Yeah. There you go. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll just use that time then. <laughs> okay. Just make it up. No one's going to challenge you, Dennis. <laughs> we always waive the reading of the minutes anyway, so. <laughs> so true. So true. But yeah, so, I, mean, so you could, I, I can go with the time that, yeah, it was actually motion. You could put just anyway, about anything yeah. in those minutes and no one would challenge you. And and even the president wouldn't know because he wasn't here. 
He's going to listen no, to the recording. I sent him, I I sent him the minutes, yeah. Yeah. All right. At, at nine eighteen, I was eaten by sharks. <laughs> I, I do think the minutes should be transmitted, maybe in the monthly email that goes out to people. I think it would be useful to have the minutes because because you do you need do. them, you know, for a nonprofit organization, and it would be interesting for those of us who were at the meeting and for those of us who were not. So they should probably be transmitted, I mean, you know, electronically. Well, I think they are being, at least to the president and for purposes of the bylaws, but they're just not right now being distributed to the membership. I think that's is, the difference that you're- Is there a reason? Is there a reason why it's not uh, transmitted to the members? I'm Nobody sure it never occurred to anyone that anyone would be interested. <laughs> well, I'm interested. Huh. All right. Note to self, Jim. <laughs> yeah, um, send them to Edgar. I mean, we have to put Edgar on the distribution yeah. list of the minutes. There you go. It will be that list. That list has now grown to one person. Okay, well that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. I should have left when I could. Make sure to triple password it if it's going to go to, to Edgar. You don't, you don't want to say what? Triple say what? Pass before you send it to Edgar. Triple password it. Yes. That's right. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you need. Just what you need. That's very funny. Well, my friends, I think I'm going to sign off with all this drama. I need to blow out all my candles. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. The power's it's back on. Yeah. Have, a good, have a good month, everybody. Right back at you. Too, Edgar. Okay. Great to see everyone. Yes, and Fred, right. are we on for Monday? Is Ellen, uh, will Ellen be receiving Monday afternoon? I'll double check with you on Sunday. It's okay. You're muted, Fred. Yeah, you're on mute. Let's see if I can get him to. Okay. Good night, everyone. All Good night. right. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night Dennis. Dennis. Take it easy. Great to see all of you. Well done. Well done. Excellently well done. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye now. Okay, we'll call it quits. Where's the button? Good night, all. Stop recording and end. Mike, you still there? Because I could uh, leave you on if you want to. Talk to somebody. If not, uh, I don't know. I'm mean, just. How do I do this?